So what the government intends to do is... Strip $1.3 billion in funding from ARENA, move ARENA into the administrative framework of the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, repurpose funding that's already been given to CEFC for this new fund to use, but most importantly, so so that's $1.3 overall gone, but more importantly, it it removes the ability to make grant funding available, competitive grant funding. So it means that if if a project is not investment ready, so can't get uh, equity or, uh, or, or loan funds that need to be repaid with interest, then it is not possible for those projects to be to be funded under this model. That's outrageous. And I would argue that, if anything, we need to see an expanded remit for ARENA, an expanded remit that says ARENA should be driving an agenda that increases the Australian economic benefit of this clean energy transition and ensures and enables all Australian consumers and communities can participate and benefit. Let me talk now about the other end, and that is large-scale solar photovoltaics. So that's big solar farms with the solar panels producing electricity. And the fantastic news is now ARENA is almost getting out of that business because they just held a large, big solar round. They they were able to provide the last 10% of funding needed. They're almost fully commercial in their own right, without government support. That's a huge success story for for the agency and for, for Australia. They only needed the last 10%. So, so Arena spent $96 million and they unleashed more than a billion dollars in private sector investment in those projects. That's fantastic. And so you can see there's a, there's a whole scale of different technologies and stages that Arena supports and all of them are really, really important. Um, look, I, I'd probably um, uh, finish by saying that, you know, we've just seen a G20 Leaders Summit where the leaders agreed in their communique to focus on innovation right, and science. This is the innovation and science where Australia has a massive competitive advantage. This is the sector we should be targeting and supporting. This is not the sector that we should be closing down and defunding at this time. $4.40 a week matters, and I think that was so highlighted, by the way, for example, when the Prime Minister gave a, a man who was on the street who was homeless $5, what that man did was he went out and he finally bought a decent meal. Um, and for community services that provide food and emergency relief, food is a discretionary item for far too many families. It's in the order of um, millions. Um, we have, for example, and I would like to table this, um, from Food Bank, its report earlier this year that highlighted the, the number of children and families that are going without food because that's the one thing they believe they can trade off. They try and keep a roof over their head. They try and make sure they can access transport to continue to get their kids to school. Um, They try to make sure they can keep the power on. And increasingly, of course, it's very important to try and keep those families connected online to access Social Security, for the children to be able to be educated. So it is food that is one of the big things that is going for people. Um, And Food Bank found that one in six um, um, people in Australia are going without food on a reasonably regular basis, and 33% of those people are children. We know also that, for example, people receiving the New Start allowance um, will lose that $4.40 a week, which is off the back of that payment not having been increased otherwise in real terms in over two decades. Some senators will note that ACOS has probably every week talked about the need for that unemployment payment to be finally increased in real terms. It is not because ACOS and the community sector doesn't have a better, more innovative idea. It's because it is the most vital safety net to ensure that when Senator um, Xenophon in South Australia, the challenge of finding jobs, the structural adjustment that's going on, that when it is you that's hit, when it is you that can't get another job, you have at least enough to live with some dignity and respect. And that is all, actually, most people are asking for. Current figures from the AIHW indicate that around 48% of children at the age of five are presenting with decay. So these are kids that don't... So half of kids aged five... Half of the kids aged five... 
to have decay uh, in their baby teeth, let alone their permanent teeth. And the figures are similar for 12-year-olds. So when you ask the question about how many of these children are coming with, that have never seen a dentist, that was CMAIHW reports around, say that around 70% of two to four-year-olds have never seen a dentist. So it's no surprise that by the age of five, when they get into the school systems, if a school dental program exists, they've already got decay. We need to be getting to these kids much younger, and that is one of the benefits of the CDBS. It allowed a, family, a parent to bring along all of their children from the age of one year and one day through to 17 years and 364 days to bring them together where they could be educated about the benefits of good oral hygiene and not long before they ever needed to um, actually have treatment done. And that's really what we should be doing. We should be preventative focused. If the government is serious about delivering oral health care to these children and to needy adults, it should not only retain this scheme, but it should utilise it to develop additional specialised programs directed at needy adult populations as well. These people have a substantial unmet dental need.